I want to turn now to the gospel according to John. <clears throat> uh, my fault, probably, we're not going to hear of the pits and piety until this evening. Um, the sermon title is That They May All Be One from John 17. And so we want to turn to John 17 <clears throat> this morning <clears throat> and to read... <clears throat> It's very hard to read, but we must read a prayer of Jesus in the sanctuary of his own communion with his Father. In John 17, it's hard to know where to pick up on this, but now let's pick up at verse 11 through the end of the chapter. Our text will be from uh, verse 21. Jesus is speaking here, now I'm no longer in the world. Uh, profound that he's in the world, but he says, I'm no longer in the world. These, referring to his disciples, are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. In the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name. And will declare it, that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. Thus far we read the prayer of Jesus. John seventeen twenty one is the text for my sermon this morning. That they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. That they also may be one in us that the world may believe that you sent me. This, of course, beloved, is the real Lord's Prayer. We often say that the Lord's Prayer and the Sermon on the Mount, our Father in Heaven, is the Lord's Prayer. Really, that's our prayer. And this especially, in John 17, is the Lord's high priestly prayer. You remember the context. Jesus is about to go in the dark way of betrayal and Gethsemane and then leading down to the darkness and the death of the cross. He prays first for himself, for the glory that he had with the Father before the foundation of the world, that that would be restored to him. Jesus is praying, really, that he might go home. But then he prays for the disciples, and most of the prayer is a prayer for the disciples. 
The disciples there, the 11 anyway, there's one who's a son of perdition. He doesn't pray for him, but he prays for the disciples who are given to him by the Father. And then he prays for all who would believe on him through believing in the apostolic word. And he prays that they would be kept in the world, but kept from the world, preserved. And there's one thing especially that Jesus points up in his prayer to the Father, and that is that when the disciples are kept, the 11 and those who would come after, there would be this keeping together. They would keep together. They would be one. They wouldn't be fractured. There wouldn't be divisions. There wouldn't be dissensions among them. There would be a remarkable unity. And really, this is what the text for my sermon is all about here. Cannot really but begin to consider these things, but we'll begin. That they all may be one. It really sums it up. And it sums up uh, for us the understanding that Jesus has been heard. We are evidence that Jesus has been heard in his prayer that they may be one. Well, look at us. Here we come together. And beloved, we're one. We're one together, hearing the word of God. One, as is symbolized in the Holy Supper, called communion, holy communion. There's a oneness about us that's of God and of grace. And we celebrate that. But at the same time, we know that there's many threats to oneness, many ways that we can all uh, be divided in our own homes as well as in the church home and with our fellow believers throughout the world. And so Jesus' prayer is still being made from heaven. It was made on earth before he died, his last prayers, and now he makes it from heaven. And there's especially something that's being sung, a philosophy that's being sung in this world. And I want us especially to take heed to that song. It's like a siren song. And a siren song is something that is sung that's very alluring so that you can get close to the song, hear the song, and then you start singing the song with the sirens. We want to hear the siren song, but only enough, beloved, not to sing it with those who are calling for a false unity. Instead, we ourselves want to hear Jesus and obey him and sing another song, the song of true unity. And so I want to consider what unity is, why we are to be one, and then how we are to be one. I must be negative. The Bible is often negative, And I must be negative here and say, first of all, what unity is not, uh, what, what Jesus is not praying for when he prays that we might be one. And he's certainly not praying for a unity and a peace like the world's peace. There's three things about the world's peace that we must avoid, and the, we must have the opposite of that, and we'll consider that presently, but first the negative. First of all, when Jesus prays that they all, all the disciples, and all who follow, who believe with them, may be one, he's praying for something not superficial, because look what he says. I'm praying that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us. Amazing. And then you go down, verse 23, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one. And so there's this unity that speaks to us of something of the Trinity. As Jesus is with the Father, so we are to be with one another and with God. It simply blows you away, but it gives us to see here that it's not the superficial kind of unity that we're hearing in this world. 
I mean a unity maybe of place. We are united as Americans. We're in America, and there's a kind of unity there. Just being in the same place, maybe having the same constitution, there's a unity there. I'm referring to a unity of purpose that people might have. Uh, we speak of those who are um, criminals in unity. They have a unity. They're partners in crime, and they want to rob a bank, and they plan it all together. And they might be very different fellows, but they're united in crime. They rob the bank, and then maybe they stay together to rob more, but then they split up. But there's a unity there of a bad purpose, and it could be uh, that there's a relatively decent uh, purpose that people have, and many are those who have this and are united in this. We should all be at peace. We should all care for the environment. And there's people who lead the way in these causes, which are not bad in themselves and of which we can um, speak and which we can join to a degree. But after all, it's just superficial. It doesn't have to do with a unity of being, for sure, or a unity of the soul. Maybe it's a unity just have to, having to do with economics, and so we vote Republican. There's a unity that people are saying of equal opportunity and of equal economic outcome, so that everybody should have the same pay, or that women and men and whoever should be paid the same. They're talking about this unity, and they're saying that's, that's the only fair thing in this world, that we don't we're not racist, and we're not those who are chauvinists, and we ought to consider each other with respect and dignity and all be one that way. And <clears throat> this can be alluring to us, but we must remember and come back to the Word, back to the Savior. He prays for something far deeper than that, that the disciples may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. This is something that has to be taken uh, into account by us, uh, what Jesus is saying here, especially in the light of the fact that there's this uh, unity, this ecumenism, this getting together of churches on the surface in today's church world, and not just the liberals, but also the conservatives. There's a unity that's just on the surface because it's not a unity in doctrine. There's a unity among those who are free willists and those who are predestinarians. And they'll say, let's just all come together, maybe come together just to show that we have some sort of unity as Christians, or that we can be a kind of a political block together, liberals and conservative Christians, and vote together uh, to respond to culture problems like abortion and other things like war and so on. But if we could just come together as a Christian bloc, then we could get something done. And disregarding the unity that is to be had in doctrine. A lot of parachurches are like this. Churches, church organiz not church organizations, but organizations that arise because they see that the church itself is not doing something, or they can fill a niche. Not to say that all of them are always bad, but when there is a fellowship that gets together in the name of studying the Bible, however good that may be and helpful that may be to people, but which fellowship avoids, studiously avoids, the discussion of doctrine and things that have to be considered, uh, we have a problem. There is a problem because the Bible speaks of agreeing in the truth and being united in the truth. As Jesus himself says in this prayer, sanctify them, the disciples, in the truth or by thy truth. Very, very important. We need ourselves to remember that as United Reformed churches United ought not to have the preeminence in the name, the very name of our federation. And I'm fearing, however, 
that unity is becoming the predominant thing among us as churches. And we have to be careful here and even repent where we have erred as churches in becoming or seeking to be united. And so, for example, you have on the floors of classes people who are questioning whether Arminianism is really heresy, as the fathers have said. It is heresy, and it ought to be defended, or it ought to be uh, combated against, and the Reformed faith upheld. Even the, uh, the very process, I know I'm being critical here, but I'm seeking to be edifying as well, the very process of our church um, coming together with others, it's called a, um, we're seeking to be one in phases of unity. There's a problem with that whole idea because the goal of all the phases in the church unity program of the United Reformed Churches is to be one in the sense that we are one with the same name. That would be the greatest thing in the world if we and the can ref could be one if we and the other churches could be one in name, not just in doctrine and in life. Oh, beloved, there's nothing here or in the rest of the Bible that speaks of a unity that necessarily is an institutional unity. So, for example, your family and my family are one, but we don't have to live under the same roof or have the same name. There's something far deeper than a superficial uh, understanding of Jesus' prayer that they all may be one, something far different than just bearing the name of one particular denomination or not. Well, that's the negative so far. I just want to end with this. This is a song. There is a song. And the song is the song of the philosophies of the world and the bands of the world and the environmentalists of the world and the compromised church people of the world and they're singing it. And the title of it in one group but really principally in another is Imagine. Imagine. It's the title of an old rock band. It's the title that rocks the world today. Imagine that there's no heaven. Imagine that there's no hell below. Imagine that there's no religion. Imagine so that we may be as one and we may live as one. This, beloved, is the song today, and it's catchy, and it's extremely popular. Just be one. Be one, well, in our sort of way. Be one in attitude, in respect for all kinds of lifestyles. Enough of this judgment of God. Imagine there's no heaven. Imagine there's no judge of the universe. That's what they're saying. Imagine there's no hell so that nobody is wrong. Imagine there's no religion. Religion, they're saying, and even Christians are saying, has been a blight upon this humanity's land, dividing us long enough. Enough of religion, enough especially of the truth of Christ. Well, this unity is taking over, and it's leading to what the Bible calls the Antichrist and the Antichristian kingdom. There's two beasts in Revelation 13. The two beasts, one rises out of the sea, one rises out of the lamb, uh, the, the land and looks like a lamb. And this is interpreted to be, arguably, the rising of the two forces that will unite from the sea, from the oceans of the nations, and from the earth and the lamb-like church of Jesus Christ. The powers that be of this world are uniting. Unity is everything to save the planet, to show respect to humanity. And in fact, this superficial and temporarily, uh, temporary unity is a unity that's altogether human. That's the problem with it. 
It's altogether human among depraved human beings. It's altogether human to build and rebuild and build again. Finally, a Babel united against God, making a name for man, united in technology and robots and computers and in a kind of peace, all against God. Jesus says to the Father, I pray that they all, all mine, may be one this way, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us. Now, I'm not sure I can explain that very well. What does that mean? Well, certainly Jesus doesn't mean I'm praying that all of those disciples can be part of the Trinity and there wouldn't be a Trinity anymore. Jesus isn't praying. I, I pray that they all may be one as you, Father, and are in me and I in you, and they're going to join us in divine essential likeness. And so when Jesus speaks in verse 22, the glory which you gave me I've given them that they may be one just as we are. He's not saying that they may have the glory of God as God. Must be something different. Must be simply this, profoundly this. Jesus is praying that there may be this deep covenantal union among believers, just like he enjoys with his Father. Covenantal union, that's what the Bible is teaching is the gospel, of God with creatures and sinners in the communion of the Holy Ghost. In Christ, this is the point. Jesus is saying that they may be one in life as the Father and the Son live in the communion of the Spirit as the triune God and the mediator, Jesus, lives perfectly in life. Jesus is praying when he prays that they all may be one, that there might be a unity of love, the fellowship of friendship and mercy and kindness and and reciprocation and giving and caring. This is what he's saying. In fact, love is something that Jesus emphasized throughout this prayer of the disciples. Verse 26, I've declared to them your name and will declare it that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. There's something about this power of love, this presence of God in the love that's shed abroad in the hearts of the saints and in the congregations that is the unity of the covenant of grace and that will be for a great power on the earth that people may know Jesus and believe that God sent him into the world. So the unity for which Jesus is praying is deep lasting and divine, not superficial, temporary, and altogether human. He's praying for a unity in the truth of God, a unity in everything that all God is all about, a unity of virtue and of power and of purpose and of motivation, a unity that's sanctified, not of this world, that's holy. Jesus speaks in John 14, verse 10, of he being in the Father and the Father in me. Jesus says he's in the Father and the Father's in me. You can't get any closer than that, can you? It's called by the theologians a perichoresis, a mutual indwelling. Something like that is that for which Jesus prays when he prays that we may be one. I in you, you in me, our souls intertwined 
a unity of what Jesus calls the body of Christ, so that every member is important. Nobody's in an appendix. We're all valuable. We all receive our life from the head, to use another metaphor, for as Jesus does, we are united in abiding in the one vine and receiving from the one vine all of the nutrients and the life and the sap that we need to bear fruit and to show the life that is in him. It's an organic unity. This marvelous thing called the unity of the body is that for which Jesus prays, also that it may be seen by our works, by our being an institute. Some people say, well, I believe in the unity of the church. I just don't go there. Beloved, if God would believe the unity of the church and his unity with sinners and wouldn't go there, what would happen? What would have happened if God himself determined that there would be this unity of himself and, and with sinners and Christ didn't go there to the world? Since we believe Christ has gone to this world and shown up and become incarnate and died, we go there where the church is manifest. We go there where there's preaching. We go there where there's sacrament. We go there where we can look people in the eye and they can look into our eye and we can cry with them and we can love them and they can love us and we receive their love and, and everyone matters. The local church is so important to show our unity of faith, our unity in God with one another. Well, beloved, why is this? And I'm moving along. Why is this? Look what Jesus says here in verse 21. I'm praying that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. Here's why. In order that they also may be one in us, that in order that the world may believe that you sent me. And I find here... Not just that the world may be saved for whom Jesus dies, his sheep out of the world, but so that the world may glorify Jesus. It may believe that Jesus is sent of God, that Jesus is real. That's the problem with all of the unity of the church today, so much of it. It's not in Christ it's in a program. It's in a policy. It's in a certain political this or a, pertin a certain economic this, but it's not in Christ. It's not so that the world may believe that Jesus is sent in Jesus alone. With much of the church unity today, for example, the World Council of Churches and the unity that the papacy is is saying must be so that we're never in conflict, Muslims, Christians, and Jews anymore. That unity is Christless to the degree that the word of God and Christ are not in it. It is blasphemous. The scandal of the church, beloved, is not so much its disunity as its unity. The stumbling block to the world believing that just Jesus is the way to unity, that just the cross is the way of salvation, that's not believed anymore. There's many ways. And peace has become God. And love has become God. And unity has become God. But God is God. And in true unity... In true unity, we show all that Jesus is the reason. Jesus of the cross. Jesus who is the way, the truth, and the life. In Corinth, they did the same thing, you know. Corinth is an example of a de disaster of a church. In this principal point, it was denying the unity of the body 
by declaring that some were of Apollos, some were of Cephas, some were of Paul, some were of Christ. Those were the holy ones, the holy rollers. But it was disastrous because they denied the truth and they denied the love of God. They were holding on to titular heads and church leaders like some today do. I'm of Piper, I'm of Spurgeon, I'm of MacArthur, I'm of Keller, I'm of Lloyd-Jones, I'm of all the Puritans. Where are people saying, we are of Christ alone? And I'm nothing, and you're nothing, and my preacher's nothing without him. That people may be turned to Christ is why we are one and why we ought to be one. And so that people give glory to him and fellowship in his grace. Well, how does this occur? This is my final point. Jesus is the reason why the church is one. It's why we're here. That's why we're at church even when we're not at church, praying for God's people here. That's why also we do pray for others, others who are not yet believers, but others who are believers. And we pray and we seek to manifest the unity of the church. But it's all about Jesus, isn't it? Look, he's praying. He's praying for it. He will die for this unity. He will give the Holy Spirit so that there may be one spirit and one faith and one baptism, the unity of Ephesians chapter 4. He lives now and he ever lives at the right hand of God to make intercession for the church and her unity. He institutes churches and gives the keys of the kingdom. So there's the exercise of church discipline. He institutes the sacraments. He himself is preaching today. He's shepherding the flock today. And we must hear his voice and the call to believe on him and repent of all of our sins. And our Lord himself is affecting this unity even through the church. So as as he prays, the church is called to pray for unity. Do you pray for unity and peace in our church? you pray for that? The church, following the example of the Savior, dies for this unity. In fact, we'd cut off our right hand or our left hand if we got in the way of the unity of the church. Leaders in the church are said, or the qualifications are such that they must be unity makers, peacemakers, leading the way, not brawlers, not into, in for a fight. And that's deacons and that's elders and that's pastor. We must be not power mongers and not lords, but shepherds of the good shepherd. And so this is how, through the Lord, through the church, through one another. And this is where it begins. How do we become one? Jesus is praying that they all may be one. At the same time, he's praying that God would sanctify the disciples by the truth. And that's so that they might be involved involved in this whole making of a church and saving of a church and calling believers to believe the elect of God and so calling them so that they are together and not divided. And that begins, I say, in the denial of each of us of himself because the worst thing for unity are selves with big egos. No, no mountains of egos in this land of unity. Only one mount, the Mount Calvary to which we all go. So deny yourself. So marriages reflect that we believe in the unity that's in Jesus Christ. So that our marrying in the Lord, young men, young ladies, listen up, is not a falling in love so that falling in love is the reason we get married. I don't want to be quibbling about terms here. But think of marrying this way instead of falling in love, will you? 
so that you might be one in your marriages. And that's it, this. Marrying in the Lord is first walking in the Lord. Not falling in love, but walking in the Lord. If you want to walk in the Lord with a mate, marry that way. Seek a mate that way. As you walk in the Lord, and as there's one who is walking in the Lord of the opposite sex, God will lead you to walk in the Lord together. That's your unity. So, you can say then, as God honors that, that it wasn't because we fell together into our arms, but it's because God graced us to walk together in the Lord. That's why we're walking together and worshiping together now. So much could be said, except I do want to mention this. The way to unity is often the way of confession of sin. It's the way of Matthew 18. Besides Romans 9, predestination, double predestination, Matthew 18 is one of the most forgotten chapters of the Bible. What's Matthew 18? You got a problem, go to somebody. They got a problem, go to that person. Humbly seeking unity and reconciliation in marriages not only, but among friends, with your minister, with whoever else there is, especially in the body of Christ. Because unity is that for which our Savior prays and dies. That's what we should seek. And now, the only way not to listen to the siren song of false unity is to sing the song of the gospel which has joined you to God and to one another. The good news. You don't have to imagine that, beloved. Just believe. Amen.